All right, recording in progress as per the uh, relay of the machine. Sounds like she might be related to Hal, but let's not hold the sins of her relations against her. She and Siri alike. Well, I guess uh, this would be, I had another show, or it's not up yet, but it'll be up shortly with uh, my good friend, Michael Peasley, but this would be the second Tom Lynn show. The Tom Lynn show, if you'll pardon the um, implicit self-aggrandizement of the sobriquet. Uh, and like today I have with me the esteemed inimitable Kamal Southall and uh, a man who does not require introduction. Uh, but insofar as I'm going to offer an introduction, I'll note that he's amongst the most encyclopedically informed people you'll ever encounter. Okay. I, with that qualification, will just announce that uh, what we're going to talk about today is this notion that I have, not just me, it's not strictly original to me, other people have mooted this as well, um, like uh, Paul King's North and... Uh, Mary Harrington in her essay, uh, Fully Automated Luxury Gnosticism to be distinguished from fully automated luxury communism. Uh, but this thesis that uh, transhumanism or the transhumanist trope, perspective, philosophy, idea is actually uh, perhaps not rooted in, but very similar to deviation from Christianity, broadly known as Gnosticism. Now we have to tread lightly because Gnosticism as a label is often laid out, spread across a whole array of thought, and it would be a pernicious error to conflate them. But as often happens with the history of ideas, the most uh, Extreme versions become the versions with, for which uh, the moniker is remembered or to which the moniker is applied. And in those extreme versions of uh, Gnosticism as a kind of Christian heresy, you have a fervent rejection of the flesh, of the corporeal, of in fact the material or embodied world itself as representing a grievous error on the part of this uh, sort of ersatz god known as the de Demiurge. The Demiurge thinks itself to be the supreme being, but is not, in fact, the supreme being. It's perfectly sincere uh, because it suffers from a kind of cosmic ignorance as the uh, derivation of a mistake as the Gnostic mythology sets it up of Sophia. Sophia is considered a kind of iteration and expression, uh, an emanation from the Supreme Godhead in as much as, or, or the, the or not so much, actually I should not say the Supreme Godhead per se, but the kind of emanation in its fullness or pleroma there's this, there's this this truly supreme principle, RK, the being which is beyond being, whose magnificence and grandeur gives forth to these expressions of which Sophia is one. And Sophia hubristically endeavors to know the being beyond being more completely than she should mm. through the application of her creativity. And as a consequence of this era, you have the birth of the demiurge and creates this realm in which we find ourselves. And whether that's actually an error or not becomes a point of controversy within the Gnostic tradition. I didn't know we were going to jump right into the deep end, but sort of like lay the groundwork, okay? I've read it. Um, as to whether or not it was truly an error because the Supreme Godhead, as 
Gnostics is all I've said so far can be said to be more or less Neoplatonic and not specifically Christian, but the Christian sort of uh, act or variation is that coming back to the Supreme Godhead in his fullness is also expressive of intense love, which then gives forth to the emanation of Christ who then <laughs> incarnates within this sphere to create a bridge for human being back to the reality in its fullness. Uh, the controversy is whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, and those who side on the idea that this is all just a terrible, terrible mistake, uh, well, they don't like the body, they don't like material things, they don't like the realm, death, la, 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 needs mm. to be escaped, and you escape it through a special series, of a special kind of knowledge or knowing. <clears throat> Um, so that is actually not even all of it, but probably enough of a sketch that we can then proceed forward to reflect on what analogies it would have with transhumanism. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, even I should, I've just been talking the whole time. I'm sorry. Please. Let's turn it over to Kamal and ask Kamal maybe this question. Um, well, I'll ask you two questions, Kamal. One is, what is transhumanism? And then, then what is the significance of transhumanism in our social or cultural moment that we should be concerned with it? And then once we figure that out, then maybe we can look at the potential relationship with Gnosticism. Hmm. So let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Tom. And of course, uh, you know, if I said anything which you found a miss or upon which you should elaborate, you're welcome to do that as well. No, I, I think it was an excellent sketch of Gnosticism. I mean, because because Gnosticism is, is in itself such a diffuse phenomenon. You know, it, it, it's, it's a wide range of different, but related religious tendencies and religious and philosophical tendencies in late antiquity. Um, officially considered a heresy of you know by the orthodox church by orthodox christianity and in the broader sense sense of both catholicism and orthodoxy emanating from uh, the roman and the, essentially the roman church latin and uh the uh, church of constantinople but uh, you, you mentioned some really interesting things, and one thing that crossed my mind, and it what tied to transhumanism, I think, in an indirect but interesting way is, so you have Sophia, this fallen Sophia, the poor gal, and um, I think depending on the sect or tendency within Gnosticism, there is some controversy as far as whether or not Sophia, when she fell trying to exert her innocently um perhaps naively exert her creative ability in creating you know the primitive foundations of this material universe that the demiurge then mucked up there's i think there's one idea that sophia died that she was destroyed and so we you myself all of us um we are divine sparks of that aeon that is sophia this aeon that was nice. an emanation yeah yes i left that part out yeah oh no i mean it's i mean it's it's an ocean you know it's just it's impossible to cover everything but i find that rather interesting because you know the, the, then we're all little sparks of the you know in the gnostic view we're literally in their view sparks of the divine noose that emanated out and into um, poor Sophia. Now, in one account, she is destroyed. And so we're, we're, we are sparks from her, from her destruction. And the Demiurge shoved us in these mindless, soulless apes. And here we are in this <laughs> rotting flesh. Oh, this rotting this, flesh. This clay cage. This horrible clay prison. Um, and other notions, Sophia survived, and as an act of mercy, 
um, and pity on some of the um, horrible ape-like beasties that the Demiurge created, she herself breathed the spark from her. Um, these divine sparks that were of her and her, of course, from the great plumor plumor right. up right, above. Right. And, and so either way, our human souls in Gnostic belief, we are sparks from Sophia, either by her living act of breathing into us mm -hmm. or somehow from her destruction, her shattered remain. <clears throat> and I find that interesting because while there would at first not seem to be a direct correspondence between transhumanism as a contemporary uh, humanistic and secular philosophy, ideology, worldview, and Gnosticism, the, I think the very idea, one of the ideas that's popular within transhumanist circles who are also um, quite diverse um, philosophically and ideologically, just like the Gnostics were. But this idea of mind transference or uploading the mind um, into the machine, um, which not all transhumanists believe in. Some believe it's possible to literally upload our consciousness, the essence of who we are that needs to, this trapped within our physical cages this within the limitations of biology and it can be liberated um, by uploading it into the great um quantum mainframe <laughs> <laughs> we will live our simulated lives out in and it, you know it's i think you know if, if someone of a transhumanist persuasion were listening to this i mean they would no doubt quibble considerably because there is a lot of there's a lot of diversity within transhumanist worldviews and I think sometimes some critiques of transhumanism makes a cartoon out of it so just my understanding of transhumanism and please correct me if 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 you think anything I'm saying is a, is a error I see transhumanism as essentially um, essentially concerning the self-directed evolution of the human species in order to escape or transcend, because transcendence is a very important notion in this, um, it's implicit and explicit, to transcend the limitations of biology. So in the um, Darwinian worldview from which, um, well, more from the neo-Darwinian synthesis, which Julian Huxley was incidentally very important in developing. And in a certain sense, transhumanism um, goes back to Julian Huxley, Sir Julian Huxley in the name that he coined the name itself. And many of these ideas are floating around for quite some time. You see popularizers like H.G. Wells in the early 20th century and many other futurists um, positing this idea of uh, an evolved humanity in the future able to do immense things and essentially becoming gods. Mm -hmm. So whereas not I mean, they are not shy about using that sort of language uh you know i uh, they will say things like we are creating god or new gods they will explicitly so that's not just a caricature and of course they're not of one stripe um but i, I don't want you haven't finished your point but, but go on no please oh, i mean you're you're right that's a that's a very good point um and I, yeah, I don't think it's a caricature at all, because that language, yeah, it's it's often found throughout transhumanist literature and in transhumanist discussions and discourses. Um, and there's no one leading figure of the movement, so there's no one orthodoxy. 
um, but so to speak. But uh, yeah, I don't think anyone could be faulted for coming away with the perception that transhumanists, whether metaphorically um, or allegorically, or almost in a sense, somewhat literally, believe in creating gods and, and, ba and basically in evolving the human species into effectively gods. And I think that's very interesting. Um, you know, in the current... So, mm -hmm. so I've got at least two things I could say so far, but uh, I'm going to bite my tongue and um, uh, ask if you could round to maybe some thought on because uh, thought what why is this matter right like okay these are these there are these people and they think we can do this thing but they're not that many people around who actually are transhumanists right you know so like it is sort of like talking about I don't know why is this not tantamount to us discussing uh, resurrection of the cult of Baal you know okay or as a goth or some other Babylonian deity right. Well, I think what is germane about, I mean, not with, you know, do appreciation that the power of the old ones should not be underestimated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Unless I tempt, uh, well, I, I couldn't tempt them because I'm nothing to them. But, uh, but, uh, but to avoid <laughs> mentioning the crawling chaos whose name shall not be mentioned. And what he who is, sleeps beneath the sea. What, so, I mean, in other words, is transhumanism just like a weird out there kind of thing? Or is it uh, perspective, which is germane to a broader consideration of our current cultural and social moment? My personal opinion, and um, feel free to disagree or quibble or, um, or correct me, but uh, as I see it, it's quite germane, and it actually has been for a very long time. It's just that uh, public awareness of transhumanism really hasn't existed. Like f transhumanism in originated within a very small group of thinkers. Um, yeah, and it took yeah. some time to congeal. Noted uh, that the Huxleys. Yeah, and 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 Huxley, exempting the black sheep of Aldous Huxley. I can't and, imagine you know, he got along well with Thomas and Julian. I, I really can't. But, well, but I'm very fond know. of Aldous, but um, increasingly, I wonder if I, I can't prove it, but just my reading of Huxley's biographies and looking at his literature um, with kind of renewed eyes, I think he was somewhat ambiguous. But I get the impression that he shared a fundamental that, that he partook in a fundamental shared worldview, which was first eugenical, um, a worldview that saw the that's just pure common sense, the necessity for the eugenical regular regulation of humanity and the eugenical regimentation of humanity. We can't leave this breeding business to these ill disciplined breeders who are ignorant and poor and of sundry unpleasant colors <laughs> the rising tide may like overwhelm us you know we the wise guardian class overseeing this ship of humanity and steering it correctly so but you know where they would differ um i like in brave new world and then in Brave New World Revisited, which was more of an essay um, and reflection upon Brave New World several years later. And then um, when it, an inter a curious interview that he gave toward the end of his life to Mike Wallace. Um, it was one of Mike Wallace's early interviews as a newscaster. And it was called, the, the if I recall correctly, um, I have to look this up, but if I recall correctly, it was called the Final Revolution. 
And in it, Aldous Huxley discusses what he saw as the final revolution facing humanity, which um, would basically um, involve the technological, whether it's medical technology, electronics and drugs, um, and forms of um, uh, computer assisted learning or technologically assisted learning, in which humanity would basically, the masses of humanity would basically be engineered to love our servitude and a refined elite who mastered the sciences would oversee this whole human project and that would be the final revolution and he saw it as something regrettable but inevitable and i think his world inevitable view, in what sense inevitable inevit in the sense that history itself is just the outcome of certain natural processes that we are vain to resist or inevitable in the sense that there was a quote unquote moral necessity to uh, enacting this project i would be speaking out of turn a little bit it's been a little it's been some time since i watched that interview and i don't recall the details but my impression the impression i took from it was that um, he saw it as more of a, of a factual inevitability that there were people working on these things. He was familiar with these people, which of course he came from these circles of scientific and technical prowess and um, philosophical and academic, um, the upper echelons of British academic and intellectual society. So he moved within these circles, his brother, Sir Julian Huxley, who was one of the uh, founders of UNESCO and its first um, executive director, if I recall, that was his title. But essentially, he was the first head of UNESCO. Um, and of course, in UNESCO's initial charter, it explicitly states that the uh, question of eugenics was absolutely vital to UNESCO's mission to examine the uh, question and problem of eugenics across humanity. So Julian Huxley and his brother, as I see them from my reading of their literature and biographies, definitely differed. But I think they shared the same fundamental worldview. I suspect Aldous Huxley thought it was kind of bad. And though inevitable in that this was the direction history was moving in, one might as well warn humanity okay this is where we're going let's think about this and not rush too fast and too blindly into it whereas i think julia huxley was thumbs up so yes. go I, hit that my to, to sum up this part of it like my impression is that um Aldous huxley was quietly critical of eugenics and the broader sort of Weltanschauung, which sort of grounded eugenics or worldview which grounded it um, whereas you are suggesting that he would countenance eugenics but simply more conservatively than would his brothers that's the impression i get I mean, but you could be almost, your take could be quite right. I just, when I read, you know, when I, I you know, when I read Huxley and, um, you know, Brave New World and so forth, right, the whole gist is difficult for me to reconcile with a mind that would be in favor of a eugenics project, in part because, you know, you look at the, the, the universe of Brave New World, it's horrifying on its face. Yes. And then also when you consider that a lot of his fictional work is almost a kind of expose as to the, uh, the, the petty immaturity of the, the British elite, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you like look at Point, Counterpoint or yeah. Alice and, Zaza and, and other works of his, what you have, <laughs> is basically a demonstration that these people who come from very privileged, a privileged universe behave like 
like like school children. They, they, they're um, most um, the most sympathetic characters in Huxley's novels generally derive um, either from the working class or are considered deviant members of the ruling class. I would agree. Yes, that's so. So it, in as much as the eugenics movement, which was a very large part of respectable intelligentsia in the early 20th century, used of itself as something that was going to be managed by the elite, self-identified elite, it's hard for me to believe that Huxley was on the same page, uh, Aldous Huxley was on the same page with it, given that he had sort of seen these people for what they were. Namely, that they're just people, okay? And like all people of mixed, you know, <coughs> virtue and vice. I think- Whatever is it, somewhat tangential, right? I don't wanna to go too it's far. Fascinating. It, it is interesting, yeah. probably worthy of greater exploration. Um, you know, I, I guess also I have to admit that I like seeing him as like the black sheep. I think you, I, I think he was, no, I, I do God. think he was very much a black sheep within his milieu and, and family. Um, Julian, for example, founder of UNESCO. You know, I mean, the, their position was frank that, you know, a lot of people just had to go, you know, just had to go for sterilization. Yeah, but and, in and fairness to that. Julian. In fairness, he did. I think he did, particularly after well, after the Second War. I think Julian explicitly made clear that his conception of eugenics was, first of all, um, not racial and wasn't racialized, and he didn't wish to see it actually as even tied to class. That if my reading of Julian Huxley is that, and this is this is of course the uh, apologetic aspect um, in which, you know, one says what one must say in public and perhaps, you know, mildly expressed words may cloak somewhat more, not radical, because I think that word is abused, but uh, perhaps more extreme uh, sentiments. But Julian Huxley did seem to want to find a solution in which for the, in his mind, for the better good of humanity, which leads into transhumanism, it, we have, you know, people who are born. It, if I were to be him, generous in what you're, in my understanding of Julian Huxley's position, charitable, then I could maybe say that he was a, an expositor of a revised Platonism, you know, that he was taking the 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 the, the myth of um, mixed metals, which I think is sometimes called something like that. You find it in the Republic and in other. Most I famously believe in Plato's Republic, right? The idea that you know there are men of bronze or men of silver, men of gold, and so forth. But the son of a man of gold isn't necessarily going to be gold himself. He could be bronze and or even clay and even a man of clay. So there is such a thing as excellence, but the excellence is distributed in an unpredictable fashion through the human species. So you need to create um, tools of discernment which allow for the excellence to rise truly to the top. You know, in some ways, sometimes I suspect that Plato's Republic is a manual that has played a greater role in the thought of the world's elite over the, the centuries than is generally um, conceded. Yeah, and I think it, there's it, a actually I think a there's a secret it. intellectual history that should be traced out concerning but the influence of the Republic. Maybe Julian, you know, the, and so you get that with the idea of. Uh, academic meritocracy and standardized testing and all that schlock, um, which you know can be seen as adumbrated, in fact, called for by Plato's Republic. 
You know, to my shame, Very I have so, yeah. laws, uh, which is supposed to be the more realistic version in a later text by Plato. I need to get around to that at some point, perhaps. But, but anyway, um, Julian Huxley then, in other words, we have to be, you know, fair to him. Uh, wasn't trying to, so, so like, uh, wasn't necessarily, it, it's hard for me to really be this fair, right? But we want to say, okay, wasn't being cartoonishly political or self-serving, whether on racial or on, on class bases in his uh, expositing of eugenics, and other kinds of uh, now usually in the mm. polite company uh, acknowledged uh, hideous ideas. Um, uh, that he was well intentioned in his barbarities. Uh, that's, about that's, polite, that's about as polite as I'm going to be with him. <laughs> okay. So, at least because I'm of Irish descent. So, um, but, um, yes. Uh, you're 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 far more capable than I am in exercising equanimity with such people. Well, um, there's there's a virtue in calling a spade a spade, not to abuse a cliche. And but like, here's the thing. Here's like, the thing. What what is that? The, what is the story that people? Before we get to transhumanism, what is the story that is told by people who think eugenics? A good idea. What do they tell themselves so that they can go to sleep at night? What's the what's the deeper story there? That's that's a good question. I personally believe that they see that many of these people historically, and I think this comes out in, in their writings, biographies, memoirs, um, anecdotes, uh, as well as just demonstrably looking at their actions, I, I think you, I think, well, there's there's an there's a certain elitism there. I think there is a certain arrogation to oneself of the status of being one of humanity's shepherds. You know, this idea of government by the wise that okay, democracy ain't a good idea, but if the peasants want it, then we don't want them to have too much democracy because they really don't know what the hell they're doing. They're a bunch of Muppets blundering around. We, the wise stewards of humanity, the shepherds of humanity, the caretakers, the guardians, the guardian class, hence Plato, um, are the perhaps unfair but very real beneficiaries of advantages of birth, advantages of good blood and lineage and social status and station and good education and all the benefits that comes with that. Therefore, it's a duty to help steer the ship of society. I, I think that worldview is, I mean, fairly crystal clear. Um, that, that, that there is a dominant minority, a dominant minority amongst humanity mm -hmm. with the, I guess you could say the right stuff, the capacity to lead the human herd away from destruction. And that maybe it's a dirty job, but someone has to call a sheep now and then, because if, all, if the sheep, I, I, I would blame Malthus. But I think this is a really a step. I mean, it's I mean, it's an essential it's aspect beyond Malthus. I think. Yes. All right. <laughs> I mean, it, it's. I mean, power elites, ruling classes throughout all time have saw themselves as the wisest um, and most capable. Yeah. Um, and it's you know one of these special children delusions that people like to indulge in, and when you have a lot of power, you can indulge in it. And at a certain point in British history, there was quite a bit of money floating around and a lot of intellectual progress. And you could actually afford to have thinkers examine these sorts of subjects. Like we have too many coal miners and mill workers and they keep dropping like flies. 
and what are we going to do about it? Well, rather than ameliorate their conditions, um, maybe we should just make sure they don't breed as much because then they'll overbreed us and they'll destroy this whole world project that we're undertaking. I think that's a caricature. I, I admit I'm making, I'm reducing this to an absolutely cartoonish uh, level, but I think the cartoon illustrates the reality that people it's a compression of its tendency yeah and i think it's i mean it is a tendency or a broad set of tendencies it manifests differently in different people but you know even like you know it's even today among very progressive and liberal and open-minded people occasionally one hears some just gobsmackingly awful comment concerning like uh i don't know handicapped people or well breed too much or just i you know it's i wish it was more infrequent than it is uh what you find in my experience is uh, of lately over the past few years anyone who deigned to vote for donald trump has demonstrated by that uh, an, an, an incorrigible ignorance and hazard of personality that, that should be that should be quickly hemmed in. Yeah, that that's the sentiment mm -hmm. sort of coming forth from the liberal elite segments of American political discourse. Yeah. Um, so it's an example. That's, of that that's a good example. You know, these slack jawed, tobacco chewing, red state dwelling, trailer park inhabiting, first cousin shagging, illiterate, uh, voting for right. this absolute cretin. And I, not to steer this too far into politics, I, I, I most certainly did not vote for Trump. Um, and I would not vote for Trump in the future. And I am not a supporter of Trump, but it is crystal clear to me that whatever flaws I see in that man and in his movement, that he's at least someone who should, like he's a political actor amidst political actors who should not be reduced to absolute caricature, nor should his followers, because they have views and opinions and desires that are quite valid and important to them. And I mean, just as a simple fact, I mean, well, there's this kind of presumption. I mean, there seems to me a very difficult, um, a very hazardous presumption part of uh, the large flaws of the liberal class that the only problem the only real problem is that people aren't listening to them. And so disagreement is quickly conflated with um, malicious stupidity. Yeah. Now, malicious that's my, stupidity. I mean, of course, one can find exceptions, but that's a tendency that I see. As a person, incidentally, from what I would be considered, or what I would consider to be hard left political tradition. That is to say, I am validly to this point an anarchist and uh, what they call in Europe a libertarian communist, okay? At least that's what I have been. Right? Distinct so from, not, of course, not I'm to not interject, someone, but distinct for the benefit of the viewers, distinct from the American definition of libertarian with a capital L Sure. And the notion of anarcho-capitalist and, you know, this sort of completely different, the libertarian tradition of we need to... radical socialism and anarchism. Um, I didn't, I shouldn't have. Bakunin, Bakunin, not Max Sterner. Bookchin, yes. not Rothbard. Okay, so, so but look, let's, 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 uh, <laughs> we got to get back on track here. Okay. Um, like I'm, I, sorry, sorry. Uh, well, I come back to the transhumanist connection in a moment, but I wanted to add what you're saying in terms of the story 
behind eugenics, like what people tell, there's another sort of deeper story about, I think, uh, the relationship with the world, okay, mm -hmm. and, and what we can do with science. And we can almost just go and be Baconian or Cartesian about it, where for, for Descartes in any event, um, science was a tool that would give us lordship and mastery over nature in order that we could expand our pleasure, abate our pain, extend our life, perhaps even flirt with immortality. All that's actually pretty explicit, even in the discourse on method or mm -hmm. You know, or you can be Bacon, be Baconian, as in Francis Bacon, uh, the writer, not the um, thinker, uh, and say that through science we can attain a kind of new power and over the world. But in either case, what is implicit is the suggestion that the world is structurally deficient. And if we know the constitution of the world well enough, we can remedy that deficiency. That is, we can fix the universe. And that is the conception of science, which we find at the birth of modernity, and which I feel is in the background of eugenics. Eugenics is just one example of, of this notion. Another example would be the, the, the hubristic aspirations of geoengineering or atmospheric engineering, the idea that we should you know, take an aggressive stance on weather modification. Which might sound at first blush like I'm that's tinfoil cap stuff, but let me tell you what, boys and girls, there are people in Ivy League institutions that are trying to formulate ways in which to interact with and modify the atmosphere precisely to control weather. And in either case, what you have is a presupposition that there's something wrong with nature and that we have to fix it. And I think that is something else which is in the conceptual foundation of not just eugenics, but I think that is also what ultimately leads to transhumanism. They do have top men working on that project. Um, right. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. You know, no, I, I mean, pers while I'm, but, I'm personally skeptical of the degree to which weather modification on a large scale basis in a stochastic system, well, system of system, even that, well, actually the language I'm using, it's like I'm channeling bacon and nature is not a system, as I believe Gotha once said. But, uh, you know, if you look at the weather, if you look at climate more broadly, as an extremely complex system, well, super set of systems, mm -hmm. the type of human inputs needed, the just calculating out um, airflow over vast areas, calculating out humidity. You know, yeah, I mean, that actually those segues to another idea. Yeah, yeah. I no, think I they're, mean, they're working on it. I, I mean, I don't think that's I mean, science fiction at all. Right, and and they work on it with the conviction that they can do it. It is yes. viable. Yeah. And let's grant and actually connect. As you're talking about that, by just the sheer computational requirements for those sorts of intervention are immense, right? Sufficiently immense that even in these confident advocates of geoengineering and atmospheric engineering. Uh, you have a kind of moment of humility. But then what do they do in that moment of humility? They say, well, all we need to do is develop more effective 
computational <coughs> what, 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 what is that? That is the uh, golden calf of artificial intelligence. Okay. Leading us back to transhumanism. Right. Yeah. So, anyway, I, I've been talking a lot. I'm sorry, Kamal. You know, so let me. Oh, no apology here. needed. I'm enjoying it. Um, it's enlightening. Uh, you made some amazing points. There's um, you brought a Bacon, Baconian aspect to the uh, intellectual genealogy of both contemporary science and also the, the 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 contemporary scientific project, with great humility because I am not a scientist. I am not as scientifically literate or as numerate. I'm just going to say something. Like to be, but I'm going to say something right now, okay? All in which science consists, the application of well-disciplined, inductive reasoning, the notion that we should be certi certifying people having some kind of esoteric potency because they happen to have some acquaintance with a specific. Uh, domain in which this method has been applied, I think is a grievous error. There is no one of ordinary human intelligence who is incapable of developing conversancy in any domain of physical science within two years. I'm going to say that right now. Not four years? Take the log out from the feet of Geography of scientists. Okay, they're fucking people. Yes. Some of them are very smart, but they're still just people. Okay, so do not genuflect for their utterances. Not to genuflect for the robes, the white lab coats Sorry. of our civilization's new priesthood. No, but just that they're. they're I got fired up. Right I there. simply no preach that gospel. Um, I simply, you know, I, I simply personally wish that I were uh, more conversant with the physical sciences, particularly physics, because um, I, I think actually, you know, it could shed a lot of light into some of the, okay, so by and large, if you look at transhumanists, the whole transhumanist scene, you see something, a scene that's primarily occupied by engineers, engineers of various sorts. Um, like neurologists, um, cognitive scientists, their conception generally of the state of cognitive science and where we are and as far as understanding consciousness and human intelligence, their humility compared to some of these, you know, pop transhumanist um, icons it's like night and day you know the actual real but again not genuflecting to them as priests just as people who have a particular competency they're normal people like you and i they just spent four years of undergrad two years masters two or three years you know doctorate a few years postgrad postdoc work on a very narrow field and so they with it they have a competency there and I respect that competency and I wish sometimes that I possess that competency and that I pursued that path. But our destinies are strange and they take hours in the path day. and yeah, they take the path they will they will take. And I'm but, not uh, saying that they don't have competency, to be quite clear. I just think that what's happened is that the competency has been hijacked by other cultural tendencies and that they do now constitute a kind of priesthood. Yes, they're not bloody priests, although they do wear a very special garb um, in movies and TV shows. Like you have that whole white coat effect. Someone shows up with a white coat. People have been conditioned to just have this very predictable pattern of deference to someone who shows up in a lab coat. But uh, no, yes. And, one thing that I've observed, like genuine scientists whom I've known tend to be a lot more humble 
than the sort of science popularizers um, are aficionados of the science, just the phrase, the science. You would rarely hear that a few years ago. And I would almost never hear that when I was hanging around a friend who happened to be an academician who in, in, in a scientific field. They never talked about the science on this. So that in a very dogmatic, rigid way. I mean, it's science is a, you know, the, the scientific method and the process of generating, producing knowledge in the scientific fields involves mm-hmm. much debate, um, repeating the experiments of other people, verifying them back and forth. This, this, so this sort of um, dogmatic insistence on kowtowing to whatever U.S. News and World Reports or The Atlantic or some other popular, you know, journalistic source claims to be the science on this particular topic. That's usually not the language of real scientists, I've observed, and it usually comes with a, you know, attached to a certain... I mean, yeah, that, that is correct, that there is a distinction to be drawn between scientism and uh, its expositors and, and the actual practice of science. Even the phrase, the science itself is more or less anti-scientific uh, anti because it connotes a certitude which is actually uh, hmm. disallowed by the presuppositions of at least the traditional scientific method. Right. But anyway, uh, I know me and my explosive tendencies, but um, circling back here, right? Um, where are we going with this? The, the outset question was mm-hmm. the potential relationship of transhumanism to Gnosticism or a particular species of Gnosticism. We've gone on down various cul-de-sacs get back to the main boulevard and also why it's even germane right so let's let let me let let me let you just talk and and work that out a little bit all right no we we should both feel free to jump in um as i see it it's quite germane and it's so the question transhumanism is quite relevant because at this present moment very um, world, the people who are very powerful in a worldly sense are focused, obsessed with, interested in, um, and avidly pursuing, in many cases, various avenues within transhumanism. Uh, from you know, you have the NBIC cluster of nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science. And so the whole idea of transhumanism, as I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that we're essentially concerned with the self-directed evolution of humanity and the transcendence of the limits, quote unquote, of biology, the limits of human biology as um, we have evolved. And so we've reached this, the idea is that we've reached this certain point of evolution is actually where it segues into eugenics, I believe, of evolution by natural selection. But now with the um, accumulated mass of human technology and techni, tools, and methods, uh, the idea is that, and I strongly disagree with this idea, but that we have shortcut the processes of natural selection, which is the um, reported realization that eugenics was initially uh, obsessed with that if we if we are not relying on nature's selective processes because humans who are a part of nature ourselves in constructing this grand civilization um, <clears throat> we've 
made things easier for the crippled and the sick. Tiny Tim can actually go to school. <laughs> he doesn't have to work in a mill and die an early death of consumption. You know, he could actually get a nice education and, you know, get fitted with nice prosthetics. Well, this somehow magically um, evades natural selection, which to me, like taking the idea of, well, and not Darwin's original ideals concerning selection, but the more nuanced ideas within the neo-Darwinian synthesis. I mean, you have sexual selection, you have natural selections, you have different avenues of natural selection. It seems abundantly clear that people are being selected all the time <laughs> um, out the gene pool if someone wants to look at it in that sort of cold way. Like, it's we exist within nature. However artificially we have... Um, now, I, and I got in a little argument with a good friend of mine a couple of days ago, and he actually, he made, he made a really good point, caused me to reconsider it. You know, I, th I thought, okay, well, we are parts of nature, whatever we do are, in a sense, emanations from nature itself. So it's a little, it's a little cute and high and mighty to posit the idea that we humans are completely divorced from nature, so much to the point that we break the whole function of natural selection because we are intrinsically part of nature itself but we have particularly in the last 200 years massively constructed um this sort of artificial edifice of non-organic um my friend argued and i think he was correct of non-organic cruft on the earth We've ripped metals out the bowels of the earth, modified them. We've, you know, taken the black blood of the earth, oil, and spewed out, you know, islands of plastic in the Pacific. And so we have modified the natural world in very dangerous ways. So yes, okay, there's artifice, there's artifice there, but who's to say that that's not also part of a process of natural selection? um from a darwinian sense so the whole idea that humans this idea and i'm, I'm not i'm not going to argue that but it's, it's something i'm wondering but certainly 200 years ago 180 170 years ago 160 years ago charles darwin and his cousin francis galton are sitting there chit-chatting and thomas huxley t huxley julian huxley's um, ancestor are sitting there and they're sipping their tea and eating their crumpets um tea looted from india um by the mismanagement of the east india company and they're coming up with these ideas and francis galton supposedly runs with it um it's a very naive way of looking at the world you know and what, so one could almost excuse eugenics as it was conceived of then from a bunch of extremely elitist, you know, abnormally elitist, um, <coughs> early ninth, early mid nineteenth century Englishmen. And I won't say British because they were English, um, but it's not tenable. The idea is, I don't think, is tenable in today's world, and the central presumption of transhumanism and that. We humanity need to suddenly take control over our own evolution as a species is self-directed and that the way to do it is through this artificial stuff that we use to break natural selection supposedly to begin with. The ideals, they, they don't cohere in my mind. Not the brightest crown in the box or the sharpest, but to me, it, that, it doesn't follow it seems forced together um, to justify a leap into a conclusion that was already conceived of before making that argument, which is that we, those who possess the wealth and power in agency and society to command the um, processes of production 
of technology that we have a moral duty we um and an a moral duty and it is noble to do so to re-engineer humanity and by doing that we can gain morphological freedom you know i can be a butterfly or a bunny rabbit or i can change my gender three times in a week or i could roll horns out my head whatever morphological freedom either physically or in the consensual hallucination of cyberspace and um I'm skeptical of it, <laughs> as I'm sure you are too. And I think it's dangerous, particularly in this wise Germain, because some very powerful people believe this. Um, the capitalist elite of Anglo-American society, many of them have the shared faith in transhumanism. Um, as a means to evade, postpone, or just completely eschew death itself, and to ultimately move beyond the human. And I th that's actually a very ho horrific idea to me because it problematizes the notion of human, that, that the human is something that we need to evolve beyond, that the human itself is humanity. Right, there's the like, rub, right? That there's a fundamental insufficiency to human being that's we need to have a new transhuman being and then there are those who even they beyond that a post-human being and they talk in those terms historically they talk about transhuman age and the post-human age yeah so, right so in the background of all that is uh, actually a kind of self-hatred hmm. right? there, um, which then becomes projecting onto nature for having inflicted hmm. the crime of existence upon us. And so you see that with these people who are antinatalist in their um, perspective. The thing that they give birth to life itself is a is a crime, right? This 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 is, this may sound like I'm caricaturing these people, but this is what they actually say. I don't think it's a caricature uh, at all. Yeah, I it's, you know, they it's, do it's, say this. They say these things, and they're quite serious about it. And they show up in various. A lot of them show up. and win or garner respect as arguing for the earth, taking a kind of strong green position. Hmm. Um, what that misses is that the species most well situated to counter the uh, violence which industrial has visited upon the ecosphere is the human species. Uh, we just happen to be the best option in terms of repairing whatever damage is there. Okay. Now, um, there's a certain. There's then like hmm. the idea, going back to transhumanism, that what we are is not of this world and that we are deluded to try and participate in it except as something from which we will ultimately escape right that's the position of a certain kind of gnosticism but we are trapped within these pages of flesh and that it's all a delusive error Sometimes I, I hear these expressions in, in, in popular discourse and I find them, I find them quite, quite off-putting, um, you know, mm -hmm. where people talk about themselves as like a <coughs> meat puppet or something like that, you know, it's like, no, stop, don't, don't talk, don't talk about yourself like that, right? Um, but that's almost even worse, right, you know? Uh, that, that sort of reflects a kind of coarser sort of mechanistic reductionism 
Yeah. Which also different. reflects self-hatred, like as you mentioned previously. The idea of seeing oneself as a meat puppet, that's a that's a yeah, very I'm sure you've heard like similar turns of phrase, right? And then it's usually sort of just sort of matter of fact. Um but it plays right into a, a transhumanist agenda. And so eugenics falls on his face. And then I think the idea is uh, maybe not consciously articulated that the problem may be in biology itself. So we have to find a way to escape body, upload ourselves into this uh, ethereal domain. There's a hostility. There's a, there's a pretty active hostility to uh, the human condition. And I mean, guess that I guess that's really it, right? So um, now it becomes almost as a footnote, like almost the, the, the potential point of intersection with historical uh, Gnosticism might just be a curiosity. Because as we're talking, what, I almost want to leave that aside as a curiosity and look at how um, what the transhumanist position is, it's, it's a rejection of the terms of the human condition. What are the terms of the human condition? Well, one of those terms is death, okay? And if you take it out of the equation, then I don't know if we're really talking about human being anymore. Uh, hmm. The transhumanist counterpoint to what I just said that I am suffering from unjustified normativizing of the status quo, or the status quo bias. Because death has always been around, I'm assigning a normative status to it consciously. But this isn't actually to be warranted. That's the, that would be the transhumanist counterpoint formally, you know, and my response to that would be that they have failed to interrogate their own experience, their own firsthand experience, because that's the one thing about donically charged quality of such transhumanist languages I've encountered is that it doesn't really take what it is to be alive that seriously. What do you think? I agree. Pardon me, I'm sorry. Um, and However, perhaps... Oh, could, a, sorry. Mm -hmm. oh, no, I mean... Perhaps where we can then return to the question of it's an it's analogy with uh, certain Gnostic deviations is through the question of what is the what is the spiritual implication of transhumanism? Well, I think before looking at that, just addressing what you previously said. So I do wonder. The question raises itself, how can one evolve beyond the human if, in many cases, perhaps one hasn't sufficiently met the conditions of fully being human, hasn't sufficiently really um, embodied the human condition itself? I would say that there are as we are all clearly humans biologically but how often do we not act like humans and this the the so the idea of rising above the limitations of the biology and having a fundamental hatred or antipathy toward the biology well most people never reach their biological potential anyway much less than their the cognitive potential or their intellectual potential or dare I say spiritual, but we'll leave that 
word out for now, but it's to me the height of hubris for and it, so you do have cases for example someone whose body has been shattered who's um who is experiencing some sort of physical infirmity and thus may feel genuinely trapped within their body i think that's a very real right. aspect of the human condition this is something that happens to some people and they Severe may paralysis dismemberment yeah. etc precisely. precisely and that, that's a cause of immense pain and human suffering but most of the people articulating the people who have articulated the core tenets of transhumanism were quite able-bodied they were quite wealthy typically mm -hmm. exquisitely well educated or highly educated right. and tended to come from the upper echelons of the um anglo-american social structure and and french as well but um primarily um we're dealing with an heavily North American and British or well, English. Movie. Well, I get the impression it's got it's uh, it's got its friends in uh, in the East as well. It yes, but uh, as far as worry, well, I mean my my view is that it's uh, just the natural outcome of of uh, how science is set up by modernity, right? So wherever modernity asserts itself transhumanism is on the way is my view so but um that is up for debate but let's not that's that let's not get go down that right now let's let's stick with what you're saying because i thought when well, you raised the limit case like oh are you saying that we shouldn't use technology to help people who suffer from something like uh, you know paralysis or dismemberment or what have you and and the answer is no but the distinction is that in looking to deploy technology to help attenuate someone's suffering in that case, we are not trying to give that person an escape from their humanity. Right. Whereas the transhumanist position, as I take it, is that humanity is something to be or something that we need to go beyond which so, which echoes gnosticism to some degree right because if we really want to return to our fully divine status we will you know surrender our bodies so that we can return to the source the one the monad <laughs> so. it's interesting to see how that how Gnostic light themes have reflected in popular culture. I mean, The Matrix is clearly a blatantly obvious example, but even like J.R.R. Tolkien, I think he inverts he inverts it to some degree because you do have this demiurge like being, Melkor, who becomes Morgoth and his lieutenant Sauron, um, and you you do have, I believe the the term the Ainur. The, the angelic, quasi divine, like powers that somehow emanated from um, the uh, one creator, and by their singing, created the physical universe. So you, <coughs> um, well, not this physical, the, the entirety of the cosmos. And Melkor was this discordant one whose music was, you know, I don't know, post-industrial. <laughs> and uh, Melkor corrupted this world. And he has his archon-like beings, um, these, uh, the um, Balrogs, the dragons, um, these other fell and baleful horrific beings that populated Tolkien's first and second age and his um sort of modern myth and um but there was a there was a salvate there was an element of salvation in there and that Melkor was well first of all the world was redeemable itself which makes sense because Tolkien was he was an Anglican right or, or Catholic I can't recall I not, I, do, I, I believe he was Catholic, but I could be wrong about that. 
I think you're right. And Lewis was Anglican. Yeah, I think, you know, and they were, of course, fast and yeah. friends. Yeah. But it's a, it's quite uh, opposite the conversation to, to bring up Tolkien uh, because he is uh, inver- he's, 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 he's actually giving us a critique of this tendency. Yes, I mean, and, that, and I think right. his life right. illustrates that, like his experiences in World War I, his experiences in battle, um, his experiences of the, hard, the, the horror of modern mechanized warfare. It shows in his nostalgia for these, you know, the, the simple hobbits, the Shire, this age, you know, it's the only individuals within his um, mythic cycle, is, uh, within his mythos, who heavily employs machinery, Saruman, this artificer, this right. Saruman, this fallen sorcerer, who I think you could maybe not, not to go into bizarre cul de sac, but in some ways, um, Saruman is very much a transhumanist. He's like the transhumanist in Middle Earth. Um, and I think in some ways, Sauron is as well, but Saruman is a more of a tragic figure. Um, he tries to craft a new type of orc, for example, the Uruk Hai. And the original orcs themselves, it's a bastardization of the nature of these elves. They were corrupted, um, twisted into this mockery of their original form. And then Saruman, being the clever technologist, he sets out and he's going to make a better orc. He's going to make a trans orc here. <laughs> And he does, and it doesn't end up well. And I think Tolkien implicitly is not only embodying a critique of some of the more destructive aspects of modernity and of the project of the mechanized society and empire, but I think, it, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I think implicitly there's actually somewhat of a critique of Gnosticism within so that really is the question then here right like what is wrong with Gnosticism good good point um the idea of salvation by Gnosis um by knowledge is a very seductive one um but I think the not being being not a Gnostic myself um, and we do need to be very careful again because there are all kinds of Gnostics, right? That's true. Yeah. Uh, but we're talking about that kind of Gnosticism that strongly rejects the flesh and appeals to a certain kind, a certain kind, a special kind of knowing as the way out of the flesh. Okay. You could call them the techno Gnostics. It almost sounds like a, a band name. <laughs> So, or at least the um, first record. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I think there was a explicitly the Marcia an album. Yes. Um, to some degree, I think there was a. Well, within this whole Gnostic milieu, I think there was um, you, you have these tendencies coming out of late antiquity, and. Perhaps I wonder if there were underground certain social traumas that were widespread throughout the society of the Mediterranean as the Roman Empire um, reached its maximum expansion. Um, and particularly because Gnosticism, I mean, the, the, orig- the origins of Gnosticism seem heavily centered in Egypt. And so you do have this. Oh. Oh, man, that's very interesting because there are ways of Gnosticism and you just made like an interesting correlation that the death of empire and the rise of Gnostic tendencies may be associated. I think so, yeah. The, you, What's you, going you, on you just there? articulated that so amazingly. I mean, look, you, so you, the, you had the conquest of Egypt by Alexander. And then 
the, the breakup of his empire into these satrapies, you had the Ptolemy dynasty. And so Egypt is under foreign rule for hundreds of years prior to, excuse me, <coughs> the death of Cleopatra, the last queen of the Ptolemies, uh, who is a Greek, now granted, like, you know, they were uh, Coptized, Coptized, <laughs> Coptized, <laughs> Coptized, Coptized um, Helen. <laughs> yeah, we well, Coptized Helen here, but um, still, she was very much a Helen. She was, a, she was from a foreign Greek dynasty that had heavily adopted many aspects of, Greek, of Egyptian culture, but they, they were so insular that they practice brother sister marriage do you know what i mean that that's a good way to avoid mixing with the common rabble if you only marry your siblings hey what's the little incest as long as it's royal incest yeah, royal incest you know never hurt anyone a few hemophiliacs here or there but you know it's the price you pay i'm sure the habsburgs and the tutors and they none of them had anything to do with any of that <laughs> which you know actually now that i think about it, i mean all right, transhumanism, okay, okay. transhumanism would actually make an interesting uh um well i won't go there right, we gotta stop <laughs> hold go guy. down this rabbit hole of yeah. sexual deviancy and yeah. can get quite right. unpleasant yeah, but, i've already uh, exposed myself by suggesting that there is such a thing as sexual deviance but anyway um no pun intended we're, we're not speaking of literal self-exposure here but um, so association between the decline of empire and the rise of gnostic tendency yeah the the the, the romans stepped right in well, where and, like what's this the spiritual problem with that tendency where i was going with it mm-hmm. where i was thinking about is that the kinds of gnosticism which we have which i'm concern me uh, they seem to be trying to eliminate the role of faith in one's spiritual pilgrimage Hmm. because if you have the knowledge if you have the knowing if you have the formula if you have the principle of transmutation right just Easy as baking bread, right? One, two, three, what do you know? Hmm. And that to me, I suspect, is the root error in a Gnostic narrative. I think you have something there. Yeah, I, I, I think. That also connects, I think, to the transhumanist seduction. They're trying to take <laughs> element of risk and the element of faith out of our life Um, but i really think it's also interesting to explore sociologically the correlation between uh, times of imperial decay and the ascendancy of ideologies like this Hmm. well transhumanism evinces a lack of faith in the ability of humanity to continue to grow and prosper and thrive unaided. Now, one could make the argument, I think it is a good argument that we've made tools since the beginning and our tools have molded us and modified us. I stole the argument from a friend, um, but I'm sure other people have made it. So. But, well, uh, but there seems to be to something it. different about modern technology, but that's another conversation. I think um, modern te- there's a greater <laughs> inter- interpenetration of technology into our lives. Um, and there is something definitely quantitatively like much different about the role of technology in our contemporary life, but also maybe there's a also a qualitative difference in how technology has is molding our life now but we are adapting not exactly functionally our technologies are killing much of the earth and killing 
many of us in the process um, hastening our well, actually, and this would just seem to be an argument against transhumanism to some degree, but um, the, if, well, it also if, is modifying our consciousness, especially oh, yeah. with the proliferation of sustained interface with uh, screen, screened networks. There, there is a, a palpable, demonstrable modification, and I will say a, de a, a dereliction of human consciousness, which is transpiring as a consequence of digital technology. Take the example of reading. The increasingly video-focused, um, and of course, like there, there, are, there are compensations and benefits, like YouTube right now, Zoom. These sorts of video devices, they enable a they enable a degree of communication at a distance and fellowship and um, transmission of information and certain experiences that were not as present. And to some degree, I won't say video has become increasingly democratized, but it's where um, we've come yeah. a far. Yeah, it, well, it's a lot different from these so, centralized model TV, movies, we're broadcasting Actually, one message right. to the masses. Yeah, you know, this is something to be taken up in another mm. conversation because I'm actually <laughs> attracted to the proposition that broadcast media is structurally anti-democratic. Mm. I, would, I would agree, yes. And I'm getting I'm this sure. from this cat, uh, Gunther Anders, who I only discovered recently. He was a Hannah husband, right? You know, yeah. His notion is that with broadcast media, instead of the relationship we have with the world being dialectical, it becomes unilateral. And the world is something we receive, and there's no more interactivity. There's a loss of friction, right? But that's that's for another day. Um, no. Though it does relate to the current. Um, conversation insofar as that technology and its deployment is an integral part of the transhumanist project. Indeed. Hmm. But uh, <coughs> we, um, the, the transformation of, of our consciousness <coughs> by contemporary technology, I mean, the shortening of attention spans, this is something that's very well documented. It's not just one of these, you know, Kind of when I was young, people had the intention spans of elephants. Now they have the intention span of ants or goldfish type of things. No, it's, it's, this is something that's been studied by psychologists and psychiatrists and neuroscientists and cognitive scientists. And it's also something I think that is extremely evident in our day-to-day -day interactions. And if we're honest with ourselves, you know, not to project, but I think many of us would admit that yeah we're affected by this too like my reading for example like the the attention span it takes to commit to a linear process of reading a book from start to finish within the last few years it's become very difficult absolutely yeah absolutely and then the other thing I I love mean, it shows up in different ways like you say oh well you know um it's not just that you are attracted to doing something else like you sit down and read 10 minutes like oh, i do something else like screens have changed our relationship with text itself because mm. we're used to the idea of hyperlinks and so forth right so mm. you could be like reading something and encounter uh, a word with which you're not or a concept with which you're not acquainted and of course you always eventually would want to look up the word or research the concept <laughs> but now but but in, in, in a different time, what you might do is bracket, proceed to the end of the chapter, mm. then go do the research. Okay. Mm. You know, but now you're like, oh no, I gotta pick up my phone and you know, look at the Google machine, as my friend Richard Cisneros calls it, right? And so um, you know, what does the Google machine tell me? And uh, it impedes your continuity of engagement with the text and uh, 
makes it more difficult for your mind to accomplish the true understanding and synthesis, which is uh, accomplished through just that raw engagement without mm. having to step away. And also, like in my own case, what I find is this temptation to be doing more than one thing at once all too often. Like it's instead of just watching a program on television, while I'm watching the program, I have to suppress the urge to not simultaneously look at my phone and play a game and just allow the program to drop into the background. Me too. It's this, 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 this uh, impulse to be constantly multitasking and it's a, it's a diffusion. It's a diffusion and it's a dissipation of hmm. mind. And it has to be active. Or like in my case, it must be actively resisted. Yeah. And actively, actively resisting these sorts of compulsions or impulses or tendencies takes an immense amount of um, not just willpower and presence, um, but just sheer energy biologically like it it it, it it's kind exerts of a paradox it. right hmm. but yeah but perhaps that makes an opportunity for um willful pursuit of excellence by by fighting these sorts of tendencies um as difficult as they are Perhaps maybe I'm just, you know, I mean, I do want to add to that the suggestion that while initially that resistance seems to be more energetically demanding, mm -hmm. on the other side of that resistance, you actually find the energy becomes freed up. Hmm. Because as you retrain your mind to be simply present, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of, you know, you're, you're no longer feel that you're being pulled in a million directions. And so the energy of, that was otherwise going to indulge probably in a manner which will probably make me remorseful, uh, a computer <laughs> analogy, right? When you close all those tabs, all of a sudden the machine runs more effectively. Right? It does, yeah. Use that advisedly. See, I use a technological analogy. And but the analogy works. It works. But you use but it as a tool. Very, you got to use it loosely. Because your mind isn't a goddamn web browser, okay? <laughs> Although, don't, let it, don't let it be this, deformed into that. Yeah. Although that seems to be the direction that we're being pushed into, like, yeah, and that's why I said it almost makes me remorseful that I use that 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 analogy because it shows how I'm also in this culture which is saturated with all of these 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 ways of speaking, which reduce our our, our being to machine being. We're not machines. We I think and that's machines. one of the central errors of transhumanism. The idea that we are just simply not not to interject, sorry, um, oh, right. but one of the spiritually, if I could say, or even intellectually, like, on multiple levels, and the human brain. Well, first of all, I think the idea of conflating the mind and the brain together is completely fallacious. It's, I mean, it's, I think it's a dumb assumption. I think the mind is more than just the gray matter up here. You know, I, I we mean, don't know what conventionally time. pretty. Yeah, yes. but the idea that even if we could build supercomputers uh, with as many, you know, unsilicon chip transistors, micronized transistors, to fit the number of neurons in the human brain, there's a there's a degree of complexity that neuroscience is just beginning to peel the layers on as far as the multi-dimensional um, manner in which 
Um, I don't mean that. I mean, not in the terms of spatial dimensions. I'm but there, just using metaphorically. Consciousness yeah. phenomena is not it's not singular. It's it's textured, it's structured, it's multiplicitous. Yeah. And it, uh, yeah. additionally, and I'm just talking about the mind. The brain also is, you know, extraordinarily rich complex phenomena you know uh the two different mm -hmm. hemispheres interact with each other in various ways it's, it's you know it's it's amazing it's, and if you cut one hemisphere off or part of a hemisphere dies the self-healing ability that previously it was believed up until very recently um it was believed throughout most of our lifetime, that brain cells could not grow again, nerve cells cannot grow again. If you lose the if you lose brain cells, if Homer Simpson sticks his head close to a bar of radium, it's gone. But now we realize that um, the neurological tissues, nerves, um, brain, uh, the brain stem, uh, this, the the nerve cells do have an ability to regenerate not only that but the brain itself can you know it's it's a mechanical metaphor but quote unquote rewire itself it can create new neural connections to get around yes which with the next 50 years of <coughs> of um information technology research of building smaller and faster computers of um, increasingly micronizing components of coming out with new clever ways to pack more components on right. a slurry silicon we like the metaphor of comparing a modern computer to human brain taking that metaphor seriously demeaning, actually it, it's extremely demeaning and it's and it says something about our culture that it wants to exalt a machine over the mind and yes. the brain. The mind and the brain that they want to, the transhumanists want to transcend is more complex than the most complex computers we have today by several orders of magnitude. And we don't even fully understand what the brain is doing. We don't understand. Yeah, we barely begin to understand. Yeah, we're, I, we're sharing the flashlight into the forest, and we've seen a few feet along the path, just using a metaphor. And one group of people are assuming that, are enthusiastically assuming that we will map the entire forest in five days at night with <laughs> a small electric torch. And then we will rebuild this forest, <laughs> re engineer it better. It, right. To me, it, it, it's not just hubris. It, strikes me as a little insane with no insult to people who find meaning in transhumanism it's just well let me say it may not it's it's minimally <coughs> it is incredibly naive philosophically yeah i should not have said insane it is an extremely naive it doesn't even have the dignity of insanity <laughs> you know but, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm obviously I'm being openly polemical. Uh, I mean, there, there is a madness to it, though. There is a madness, right, where they talk about conquering death as right. something worth doing. We've been going over about oh, oh shoot, we're going to us up on we're about an hour and a half in. So I think yeah, how far should, do you want to go? Well, we should start maybe thinking about rounding it up just for sake of time. Right? It's one of these subjects that the rabbit holes crawling, that we can right? dive down it's crawling. Or, right? you know, mole tunnels interconnecting with rabbit holes and and sewage tunnels as well. Because there's a lot of really manky, stinky thought. Are stuff that passes for thought, and this is okay. And I think both of us were 
kind of feeling our way towards this. There's a demonstrable tendency within transhumanist circles, not the broader masses of fans and people who subscribe to the philosophy or worldview, but the actual, I hate using this contemporary term, but thought leaders and influencers, quote unquote. The, um, the high priests. The high priests. These, you're dealing with people who, and it's going to sound like a freaking crazy conspiracy theorist here, but I think this is demonstrably obvious. Me and George Carlin. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. Let me look at Ray Kurzweil, who uh, I think in many ways, well, I think, I do think he's a genius. I think he's an extremely intelligent man, but I think he has an extremely reductive worldview, but he's very good at what he does. If um, you say so, <laughs> I, I don't. I take I, it on faith. I haven't, I haven't I found him found him particularly. So. I don't think he's, I don't think it's deep, but I do right. think that within his field of expertise, he has a competency within the specific narrow field of his exp expertise there probably I mean, what was his claim to fame he did something with ascii didn't he or uh, early sound processing that was it wasn't that he did some yeah. kind of code work in terms of uh being able to code sound and use in some music software and things like that yeah but beyond that he also possesses i think of extremely good understanding of the contemporary tendencies within computer science. And I don't want to take that from him. But... Right. Okay. I mean, maybe he does. But I do I, think. I mean, part of the reason I'm skeptical of Kurzweil is that I could not get 40 pages into <clears throat> Singularity is Near, as I recall in his book without having to put it down in virtue of the fact that it was already saturated with multiple and gross factual error not philosophical error not argumentative error he was just citing things that were factually incorrect mm -hmm. at a rate which i could not respect and and so, so there you have it right right who knows i mean you you know you can have there are other people i think yeah other there's a guy, actually, I was like horrified by the stuff that he was writing. But if you were looking for a strong man instead of a straw man, mm -hmm. I think Ray Kurzweil. Sorry, Ray. Sorry, I can't. Oh, okay. oh I'm going to hold myself back. Hey. I almost said something that would be a little unkind. All right. Um, but I think a really uh, effective advocate for transhumanism is this guy, Nick Bostrom, B-O-S-T-R-O. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's a clever cat. He's a clever cat. Um, but <laughs> there is a flatness to their world, a flatness, a lack of depth, which I just find honestly a uh, enigmatic that bothers me a great deal and and it's it's i mean maybe it's it's a subjective call on my part but i have observed this as well that i mean it's one thing to be extremely technically adept right at some narrow <coughs> some narrow eldritch just obscure field that five people on the planet or 10 people on the planet yeah. are conversing in. But that sort of cognitive prowess does not equate depth and depth of being, depth of thought, um, a depth of understanding the human condition, hence flatness. I would contend that only someone who hasn't understood the human condition in its broadness would want to transcend it the, the 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 rich ocean 
of <coughs> potentiality that rests within the most humble human, the most humble man or woman born in the um, lowest station of life and subjected to the worst grinding conditions um, that would rob people of the ability to actualize the to actualize the possibilities that these that many of these transhumanists uh, being born from very special wombs, no doubt, um, within very special stations of life, and thus benefiting from advantages, which many people have not, which is not a crime. I think the whole, the whole, and, and I hate calling it woke because it's a misapplication of what wokeness originally meant anyway, but they sort of um, chasing down privilege increasingly um substitutes for any like intelligent conversation on the left any sort of real engagement within um questions concerning uh capitalism the distribution of capital questions concerning um the plight of uh, the working class questions concerning um the uh, what are so you abstracting yeah. sorry go on really yeah so I'm, you were I'm going gonna... with and we kind of got pulled off yeah. talking about Kurt Schwab, Bostrom, specific transhumanist advocates but there you're about to highlight a tendency amongst those advocates yeah that they that there is a shared participation in of, of these people in They, they they often hail from the intellectual and social elite of our society, and our culture, and for them to arrogate to themselves the right to judge what conditions of humanity, um, not just need amelioration, but just need to be wiped out, just rendered extinct just, just erased because so, they're not good what you're suggesting is that they are parochial extraordinarily parochial there's a parochialism parochial. about human experience which is uh characteristic of their critiques or yeah. the, you know, the, the critiques that they offer of human life yeah and i think that's why their critiques are quite flat and so what you mentioned about death death the existence of death gives an immensely rich vein of meaning to human existence human life the the existence the, the fact that we are all facing a clock that's constantly ticking down um adds a dimension of urgency to human action that I think is more of a gift, um, uniquely among the great apes. They are our closest genetic relatives. Humanity has an extremely long lifespan. Now, turtles have a much longer lifespan than we do. And um, I'm sure the inner world of turtles is extremely fascinating because i'm, I'm i i i think well turtles are probably quite intelligent um within their own way but the human ability to acquire knowledge and experience and reflect on that experience and transform that experience and find meaning within those experiences and to trans transmit it to others and then to bow out off the stage so that we don't clog up the planet and continue to eat more than our share and we pass on this growing project you see i think the thing with transhumanists is that the privileging of the individual cloaked in the name of protecting the species helping the species of humanity 
evolve beyond its limits is really just about certain people. I firmly believe just being afraid of death, not wanting to die and wanting to continue to write, you know, sleep so. I mean, who doesn't love life? But I think it's rather, they lay on rather thickly in implying that the benefits of transhumanism, if we reach this singularity that's been prophesied by these techno priests, the idea that these um, technical processes and products will be evenly distributed among humanity, I think it's extremely naive for anyone to assume that. If we just look at the unequal distribution of bread, of living spaces, I mean, well, I mean, this is world today. So this almost would transpose into the conversation about technology and our specifically technology and our relationship with it. Hmm. Because the uh, transhumanist rejoinder to your suggestion is that these issues of distribution, et cetera, et cetera, all we need is better technology. Uh, that's, you know, in a nutshell, their counterpoint. Yeah, I think that's demonstrably false. I mean, yeah, they- and I think it's false not just because of the current state of technology. I think it's false because technology is structurally incapable of affecting that kind of change. That's not what's going to create a better world. But humans changing our social systems <coughs> is what can do that to the degree that we will or will not. Um, the or even the move beyond system but yeah. i mean look, look at slavery and then look at wage slavery at the beginning of the industrial revolution the argument can be made that slavery was made obsolete by great advances in technology i don't think that's really necessarily true um it, it, it seems like a pretty weak argument actually but go on i mean it's Slave labor was your point. Yeah, I mean, slave labor is still not not to, I mean, be gauche about it and like inappropriate and just like, I mean, bring up like negative stuff. Right. But, <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes if you can get away with paying someone, you know, ten cents an hour, that's going to be more profitable than an expensive machine. Right. It needs to be constantly engineered. And you know that if someone's willing to take 10 cents an hour, they're probably not doing so well. So they're going to be with you until they can't do it. And then you just get someone else in you know, similarly disgusting traditions. Yeah. I mean, sweatshops right. still exist to this day. Well, you know, there's a reason we all have cell phones. Yeah. But the uh, Coltron and other rare metals that are in very important to the construction of the chips of these cell phones are often mined to this day by what's effectively slave labor and our They're manufactured in yeah slave labor exactly and so technology has just i i think a good argument could be made that technology has simply enabled more diverse and creative forms of slavery that are essentially slavery, but they're essentially it still seems slavery. like that might be something in a very trilateral commission report, like a subtitle, right? Maybe it's something a very young Kissinger typed of... out. Slavery. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, it's... I, I mean, we can keep going, obviously, probably all night, but we, yeah. I, we should wrap it up here because we're, I'm, I think we're at. So, what, so what are you? Some of your thoughts um, um, along these lines? More? Well, you know, I think that what you have in the case of uh, the Gnostic, being very hesitant about my critique of early Gnosticism, mm -hmm. are because our mutual friend Brett Ramsey reproved me as being simplistic, and you know there are all kinds of Gnosticism, right? So I want to put that caveat out, out there. Um, but uh yeah um but, and he had a he had a good point yeah right right so 
but the thing about those sorts of esoteric forms of Gnosticism is that they are fundamentally evasive. Hmm. They are, in my mind, a renunciation of the task of life. They invite us to live in bad faith by denying the necessity of faith in one way or another, to the constitution of human existence. I'm being existentialist here, right? You know, I, I'm being pretty explicitly existentialist in my framing of the matter. And I'm also uh, uh, going to take that critique and then turn it and say, this is also what's, what's going on with the transhumanist project and the relationship it wants to establish between human being and technology, is that it's evading the task of human existence and compelling us to live in bad faith and pretend to be something other than what we are. That is radically free beings confronting the circumstance of facticity and finitude. And that's very existentialist language. Let me just add to that, that I'm not an atheistic existentialist, okay? I'm sort of more theistic existentialist in that the exercise of that freedom within facticity is most fully realized by establishing a relationship with some kind of transcendence. What that transcendence is, we can take up at another junction. Uh, but that's, those are my thoughts in a nutshell in terms of the conceptual core of the issue at hand. But you know, what about you? What are what are what are your closing thoughts here, Mr. Southall? I mean, I'm in agreement. Um, <clears throat> and the the one difference between certain streams of Gnosticism, Brett. That's a very good point. It's quite apropos. The Gnosticism was a very complicated and nuanced um, set of beliefs and tendencies. So is transhumanism. And there's there's a lot of like sometimes critiques of transhumanism tend to be tend to have a certain um, <coughs> ham fistedness about them. And the transhumanists, they, you know, they, they, they differ among themselves, but there's an overriding tendency within transhumanism that I think shares a fundamental error, and I do believe it is an error within Gnosticism, and that is, it's not the hatred of the flesh, it's not the hatred of the world and its challenges but rather so much, but more the seeing of the human condition and the human situation and the human embodiment within this world and the wholeness of the human being within all of our physical and emotional and intellectual and you know spiritual just manifold aspects. And seeing that wholeness as something that's broken and that needs radical fixing, and then seeing the the world in which we find ourselves embodied as fundamentally broken and evil, and I think that's an immense error, a perspective. It's 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 and it is a perspective error. It's one sees certain relative evils, and then. I think blows that out of proportion. Someone could say, oh, it's easy for you, Kamal. You've had a fairly comfortable life. Well, no, I haven't. But I've had a life more comfortable than some people. Yeah, and other people have had lives vastly more comfortable than me. And that's sort of like calculus of <laughs> who has experienced more misery in life and thus more deserves the right to see life as pure, rubbish and evil and unredeemably broken um and not to get too theological but as a muslim 
there's also like for me anyway there's there's a fundamental difference in perspective in that um within the theology that i subscribe to there isn't the perception of the world as being fallen in itself um it's not even the idea of man being fallen it's not implicit in the quran itself um although that could be read into it i think incorrectly but for me the world itself is a garden and we are here as you mentioned before there's a certain you know whether it's providential or just a matter of pure accident there's a certain centrality to the human condition in that we are the ones who can best fix the aspects of the world that we are our predecessors broke but beyond that there is an aspect i think to humanity in which we are also uniquely placed not by superiority um not in being apex predators or top of the food chain or something like that but simply because you know certain faculties that we have that turtles don't turtles have faculties that we don't have and roles in the world that turtles and tortoises are uniquely positioned to play and because of our arrogance collectively in wanting to be god wanting to be deus ex human evolving into just pure deus machine for the transhumanist but i think this mistaken perspective is found across the board in our culture we don't see that we, we don't see but we are just we are here experiencing and living in this world as much as a cat or a fly or a gnat or a turtle and each of us each of these species or different types of beings a tree or um a gardenia has a unique role and i think humanity can have a role of custodianship of cleaning up the planet cleaning up the world and of adding to it of um helping bring out bounty from it that um not for the sake of humans but for the better sake of the entirety of the world um But if we presume that this world itself is evil and is something to be escaped, then what is the meaning of us being here? Some evil demiurge making us and like shoving our spark in some like wet clay and it's like, oh, go out there. That's not convincing to me. It may be convincing to someone else, but to me it's 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 not a compelling narrative and it's not convincing. So too with trans. Even if it were the case, you know, how do you deal with that situation? Yeah, there's mo there's many ways of dealing with that situation other than wanting to escape. Seeing the world itself as a prison, it's just a change of perspective. Why not see the world as a garden? Why not see the world as um, an immense expanse of beauty and wonder rather than seeing it as a jail? And I think for transhumanists, the our embodied state as human beings for most of us who have nowhere near lived to the potential that we have just within our biological selves our biological state it is such arrogance to then argue this is all broken this is all limited we need to <laughs> transcend beyond it and become gods first of all like seeing the crappy job oh, excuse me, the crappy job we've done of like just being normal humans i don't think people would make very good gods <laughs> i think i think the world will be manifestly worse off um this is beyond the fact that we're not gods we can never be gods um even if one uses that term metaphorically, it's it's a supremely arrogant um, perspective. But if transhumanists had the power and potency and might that they believe is 
the birthright and destiny of humanity to self-evolve into, I warrant that the situation in the world would be worse than it is by entire orders of magnitude. Many orders, many orders of magnitude. Yeah. yeah, it would it would be a, a complete oh, mess. I mean, yeah. So. It's, it's, it's like cheap science fiction. Like, I know, like Zardox. Sean Connery and Speedles with like, I mean, <laughs> that film itself is somewhat of a critique of transhumanism. I'll be a very druggy one. No, I, I mean, think it's worth I mean, watching. I guess I'll have to put that in the description. Okay. <laughs> Zardok. All right, man. I got to wrap it up. All right. But I think we covered a lot of ground and yeah. uh, hopefully it's uh, engaging. Oh. To those who are kind enough to listen so hopefully thank you for I having me for being on man oh uh, thank you for having me on tom and um i look forward to talking with you again soon rock and roll talk All soon right. take care bye